the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. He must be out of his mind. I know that's what you're thinking when I stand up here, or even maybe when you hear David speaking at the, uh, the lectern there. He must be out of his mind. There are all sorts of good reasons why somebody might accuse you or accuse one of being out of their minds. Maybe they're doing something that is ill-advised or uncomfortable, like moving to Houston in July, which I did, or having a midlife career change. He's out of his mind. Or maybe because somebody is doing something that is dangerous or harmful, like jumping the Grand Canyon on a motorcycle, or riding one's bike in city traffic, or trying intentionally to harm other people. That person is out of his mind. Or maybe for doing something that's irrational or unconventional. Having conversations with your cat, for example. Or becoming an artist, maybe. Or living in an off-the-grid cabin somewhere in the woods. He's out of his mind. One time I remember being almost told directly, you're out of your mind, is when I uh, told a, uh, a friend's father that I was planning to go to seminary. And he really thought that was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard. A normal person like me going to seminary, that will ruin your life, he said. And he didn't mean the seminary education, he meant the, the career choice and the way of going forward. That doesn't make any sense. There's no money involved in that. I had a student in a former school, and his, his parents were both very successful in their fields, and he could not believe that I was happy being a school chaplain. You don't want to be the top of your field. You don't want to be the rector of a cardinal parish, he wanted to know, interestingly, because even in his teenage mind, I was out of my mind for what I was doing. Now, Jesus had a reputation for being out of his mind, and you can understand that. Just from the Gospel of Mark up to this part that we heard uh, read from chapter 3, these are the things that Jesus has sort of ticked up to, to earn this reputation of being out of his mind. He commanded evil spirits to be quiet. I don't know what that sounded like to the, to the casual listener, but it, it was enough for people to say he was out of his mind. He told sick people, paralyzed people, that their sins were forgiven. He answered questions that were not being asked out loud. That's, that's a little strange. He's, he's out of his mind. I don't know what's going on there. He hung around with the sinners and tax collectors, something that was absolutely socially unacceptable and would be a mark against him in society. And he publicly challenged the religious authorities of his days. When they asked him questions, he had a snappy answer. Well, the, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, of course. It's the sick. And Sabbath is not made for man, but man for the Sabbath. Actually, it's the other way around. Man is not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for man. So these things would have led people to say, you know, Jesus is out of his mind, plus all these reputed healings of, of various people. Even Jesus' family and friends, his, his mother and brothers, hear of this reputation, and it's not clear from the text whether they themselves think that Jesus is out of his mind or whether they've just heard that other people are saying that Jesus is out of his mind and they tend to agree with them. But in any case, Jesus' family, his mother and brothers, come to seize him, to come to take him out of harm's way because they fear that he will do himself harm, maybe do them harm, uh, and do harm to those who are listening to him and entrusting in him. We hear in, in, in Mark chapter 3 that the Pharisees had gotten wind of what Jesus was saying and doing, and they had come from Jerusalem to listen to him, to hear what he had to say, 
And in fact, in their minds at least, and we don't even know if this was in external conversation, but we're told they believed that Jesus was possessed by Beelzebub. He's out of his mind because he's possessed by Beelzebub, by the devil, by Satan. It is by Satan that he is casting out evil spirits and, and doing these, these healing things. They basically are believing that Jesus is evil and involved in the advancing of evil around him. And Jesus, uh, of course, addresses this challenge, these questions, as far as we know, unspoken, and says, that's a crazy idea. Evil fighting against evil? How could evil win if it is divided amongst itself, like a house divided? This doesn't work. What you're proposing, what you're suggesting, what you're thinking is ridiculous. In fact, he would imply, the only reasonable conclusion of seeing the things that I'm doing and hearing what I'm teaching is to understand that I am from God, that he, his disciples would later come to understand, am the living God in their midst, doing the work of God, healing, doing good, bringing health, bringing restoration. In fact, he goes on to say in a parable, I have come to tie up, to bind up the strong man so that I may rob his possessions. Make no mistake about it. I know what I'm doing. I have come to defeat evil and to steal from evil those in evil's possessions. You people who are deceived to even consider and think that the things that Jesus do, has been doing are themselves evil. He has come to release, to rob them from the one to whom they are captive. Satan, Beelzebub, the strong man, evil itself, set them free, bring them release, bring them healing, bring them forgiveness. Now that might confirm in some people's minds that he is out of his mind just by saying those very things. But it's really clear in this passage that there are two reactions to Jesus. There are those who reject Jesus, who deny what he is doing, who dismiss or make excuses or try to explain away what they have observed and seen in his interactions with other people. They ignore him, they diminish him, they patronize him, they come to take him away and protect him. That's one side. And the other side, Jesus says, are those who come in humility, who come in desperation for help, who know their need, who sit at the feet of Jesus, who listen, who learn, and who receive from him what he and only he can bring. Those are the two reactions to Jesus. And unconventionally, when Jesus' own mother and brothers come to him and he is alerted of the fact saying your mother and brothers are here Jesus doesn't do what normally one would do in loyalty to one's family and especially to one's mother to interrupt what he is doing so that he may attend to them and, and see why they're there but that's exactly what he does not do instead he says who who are my mother and brothers? Who understands what I am about? Who is a part of what God is doing through me? Who gets it? Who understands what I am about? Apparently not my mother and brothers standing outside trying to get me away from these crowds to protect me, to seize me, to keep me and perhaps others from harm. No, the people who get it, the people who are my family, the people who don't think I'm out of my head because I'm not, are those who are sitting here listening, receiving, understanding, at least in part, what I am saying and what I am about. There are those who would shrink back, who would, who would draw back away from Jesus. 
and those who would step and step forward and stand with him and say, I am with Jesus, I am trusting Jesus, that is who I am, that is what I am doing. Jesus is clear. This is, this is confirmed in a passage we heard read from Hebrews. The whole letter of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is telling his readers that Jesus is indeed, he is the ultimate priest who takes not the blood of animals into the temple, into the holy place of the temple, but he is the ultimate priest who takes his own blood into the very presence of God to show fully that he has given himself that others might be forgiven. Jesus is the ultimate priest. He is the perfect sacrifice. Once for all, he died and shed his blood so that people, sinful human beings, could be forgiven. Sins could be taken away by his blood, not by the blood of animals repeated annually, but by his blood, the perfect sacrifice, God himself giving himself that we might be free. He has come to bring reconciliation, to bring true spiritual healing and health and life, eternal life, salvation. That's what Jesus has come to bring. And the writer of Hebrews says to those who have read what he has just been writing, he says, do not shrink back from this. Do not turn away from this truth about who Jesus is and what he has done. Because there is no other way to be forgiven, to be reconciled, to be known, to be understood, to be forgiven, to be healed. To be brought into a relationship with God that we were intended to have, that without Christ we do not and cannot have. He is the only way that that might come about. The only way. Do not shrink back from that. Endure. Have confidence in this. Not in your own strength, not in your own ability to endure, but in his faithfulness to you. There is no one who can be as faithful to you and to bring to you and for you what you need than Christ. Only he can bring what we need. So how does this apply to our own lives? How do we consider this in our own circumstances, in our own, situ in our own situations? Surely we here, gathering here, listening to the scriptures prayed and taught and read would say, well, I'm not one who would shrink back. Though, though maybe in your head there's, there's, you have some questions and some doubts perhaps, and that's, that's to be uh, understood. But we are not the ones to shrink back. We're the ones here listening to the message. We are the ones here worshiping with a community in faith. We are not those to shrink back. However, we all tend to shrink back. Sure, on Sunday or doing Bible study, taking notes, listening to what's going on, we might say, yes, that's where I am. I'm trusting in Christ and and in his blood for my forgiveness. And yet don't we always, repeatedly, in small ways and large, shrink back from relying on him only for our, for our life, for our health, for our salvation? Sure. We tend to shrink back. We, we think about ourselves and our own self-reliance. We think about our education and our intellect. That'll help me. That'll help me understand Jesus a little bit better. That will help me in my Bible study. I'll know what I'm looking for. Don't we trust in our own accomplishments, our own stability, our own successes, our own finances to, to make our lives comfortable and easy, our own political positions, our own social activism to help those who are in need? Don't we rely in what we can do to make this world a better place? We so easily shrink back from relying fully on Christ 
for our salvation to adding to what Christ has done by our own efforts, our own insights, our own intellect, our own aspirations, accomplishments, and abilities. This is not always a matter of turning away from Christ to another alternative competing philosophy or religion. In these little things, we so easily slip into thinking that we can accomplish something, that we can show ourselves to be more acceptable to the God who loves us, to showing those around us that we are indeed faithful in our following of Christ. We can sometimes fall into despair and hopelessness, not seeing Christ as the one who heals and who strengthens and who is indeed with us. Peter reminded his um, listeners in a sermon before the elders and uh, the leaders of his people that salvation indeed is found in, in no other name. No, under, no other name is under heaven is given by which we must be saved but that of Christ. So are we out of our minds? Are we out of our minds to trust fully in Christ? Are we out of our minds to say that any career or political aspirations, any pursuit of career or education, any accomplishments or good deeds uh, bring us no closer to God? Are we out of our minds? Is our hope only in Christ for our future? Is our confidence only in him and what he has done for us? Is our security found in the hope of resurrection? Is our identity in him as a follower of Christ? Do we place our full value in who he is and what he has done for us? In Christ's love for us, in his death and resurrection for us, in his purpose for us that we be re reconciled and made right with our God and creator, that we be known by him and know him, and that we may glorify Christ by our coming to him fully. Sure, we'd say we're not those who would shrink away, but neither are we those who find it easy to trust in him. So the writer of Hebrews reminds us, his readers, not to give up meeting together, to hear again this message, to encourage one another that it is fully him who brings us life, who brings us peace and reconciliation, who brings us health. It is him alone. May we not shrink back from that. May we not lose confidence in what he did for us. May we boldly stand in or fall on our knees boldly before the one who has come to bring us life, that in him we might find what only he has come to bring. Life is in him. May we always be reminded of and remember that our confidence is in the one who came to steal us away from sin and death, that life is in him, that we might know eternal life every day and always. Amen.